All my friends are here. I want to introduce you all to one person, um, an old family friend, McLeod Turner, seated right there in the, in the blouse there, the blue blouse. She is a Mobilian. There are two Mobilians in the room. There's Alec Mosley and McLeod Turner, who are um, her daughter, Justa, was my younger sister, Rosemary's best friend growing up. And we still are keep in touch, and Justa's one of my favorite people in the world. Thank you so much for being here. It's weird seeing Mobile faces in this particular room, though, to be totally honest, and a little bit disorienting. Um, <laughs> What a uh, privilege it is to be standing up here before you all today. There are way too many people to thank, but let me name uh, just a few. Wyatt Prunty, of course, for inviting me and welcoming me. Where'd you go, Wyatt? Thank you, Wyatt, so much. Um, thanks to Megan and Adam and all of the staff, other Adam and the other Adam. Um, <laughs> I know, I know this isn't easy, but thank you for making it uh, look easy and feel easy and for making it feel about as comfortable as it could possibly feel for this particular newbie. Um, thanks to all the faculty, uh, especially my intrepid uh, workshop partner, Randall Keenan, for letting me ride his coattails a little bit. Thanks to the students in the workshop. Um, I've been saying all week that it's always a joy to talk about good work. It's always easier and more productive to talk about work that's so fine. Uh, and that has certainly been, been the case in the workshop. I, I felt like every single comment <clears throat> uttered by every single person in the workshop was meant solely to make the fiction better, never to tear anybody down. And that's a really great thrill when you're teaching all the time. Uh, so thank you, students. Thanks to all of you for being here today. What a pleasure it has been to share these two weeks with you here at Hogwarts. <laughs> um, for real, I mean, the place is a little bit Hogwartsy. You know, you, you walk out of the classroom onto that balustrade and you're like, this is not the real world that people live in. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm going to read a couple of short sections from uh, Evening Land, my most recent book, um, and then I'm going to read uh, a newish piece. Um, so just by way of context, Evening Land is a collection of linked short stories set around Mobile Bay in South Alabama, where I grew up. Um, and of course, I wanted each story to stand alone, but because there are recurring characters and recurring themes, and because the place itself is so close to the heart of the book, uh, not just the geographical place, but the history of the place and the people who make up the place are so close to the heart of the book that my hope with this collection is that as you read the stories, um, they'll begin to acquire a kind of cumulative force and that you'll be leaning forward from one story into the next. And what I'm gonna try to do today is read three pieces from three different stories um, to try to give you a sense maybe of how place and character and history are working together to tell a larger story. That sounds like a reasonable proposition. And, well, I'll talk more about the book as I get into it here, but I'm just gonna start at the beginning, not only because of the obvious logic of starting at the beginning, but because I think um, beginnings are really interesting, right? Like the entree point into any book, short story collection or a novel or a collection of poetry, teaches us a lot about how to uh, read the whole book and gets us sort of, uh, sort of shapes our consciousness in a weird way that lets us anticipate the rest of the story. So I'm gonna read from the beginning of a story called Water and Oil. Just a, a little warning. Sorry, that, that was a dramatic pause that was not meant to be dramatic. A little warning, I forgot to bring my reading glasses. I think we're gonna be okay. But um, does anybody have a set of readers? If I, I, just in case, keep them handy. Throw them, just throw them at me if you see me doing this. Um, <clears throat> strong is better than, than not being able to see at all. Here we go. Uh, this is the beginning of a story called Water and Oil. None of this is true. All of this is true. I want to tell you about a boy in a boat on a nameless creek, about dawn reflected on the water, but so dim over the swamp that it failed to illuminate the spaces between the trees. The boy's name was Henry Rufus Bragg, and though he was 17 years old and would most likely have been offended by my description, there was still enough boy about him that the word remains appropriate. He was handsome, but in an unfinished way, 
especially in summer when the sun freckled his nose and cheeks, blurring his features, a faint constellation half a shade darker than his tan. Six foot three now and not through yet, his bones ached at night with growing pains. A late bloomer, his mother called him, the last of the model airplane builders. A tender boy, a quiet boy, an odd and earnest boy who, like the keeper of some lost art, memorized old knock-knock jokes and repeated them in his head when he was bored. He lived on the nameless creek with his mother and his father and his younger sister in a white house with long windows and plantation shutters, porches front and back, the only house in sight. The creek drained into Dog River, the Riviere aux Chiennes, on the original French settlers' maps. And here the boy, called Bragg by everyone who knew him, would nudge the throttle down, boat nosing upward before easing into a plane, spray hissing around the hull, often as not startling a sleeping egret into flight. At moments like those, racing toward the big houses with big wharves crowding both banks of the river, and away from the lush untidiness of the creek, the boy was washed with a feeling he could not have put into words, a kind of rising, something to do with youth and his own fluency behind the wheel, and how well he knew and loved this place. 10 minutes to Dog River Bridge, then 40 more between the channel markers in Mobile Bay to Dauphin Island, where the EPA had set up shop. I am writing, of course, about that recent season when the offshore oil rig Deepwater Horizon blew out in the Gulf and the bottom of the ocean sprang a leak. His father owned a marina where the boy had worked previous summers scraping barnacles, painting hulls. Though he could have used the boy's help that summer more than most, he could see the hard times coming. His wife wanted to encourage her son's better instincts, and neither of them wanted the children to worry. So they agreed to let him volunteer, after school at first, and then, once school let out, from morning until dusk. Because the boy had his own boat, a bearded Oregonian named Jinx McPhee put him to work patrolling the mouth of Mobile Bay, eyes peeled for signs of oil. Once he'd reported for duty, the boy charted a course back and forth from Fort Gaines to Fort Morgan, between which Admiral Farragut dammed the torpedoes at the tag end of the Civil War. He was careful to steer clear of the hulking tankers headed in and out of port, his wake fading, reconstituting itself, Willie Nelson twanging in his earbuds, summer stoking up with every hour. He chuckled periodically at the jokes he told himself. At noon, he veered in the direction of his father's marina to refill his tank with gas, charge a hamburger at the snack bar, and pass a few minutes in the presence of Dana Pint, the girl I should have known would be the first to break his heart. So there's how we begin, off to a roaring start. Um, there is a kind of, yeah, there it is. I feel like a poet flipping around in a book. <laughs> there is a kind of um, deliberate motion from story to story here. Um, I mean, the most obvious one is removing linearly through time. The book begins in 2010 with the Deepwater, uh, Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Um, a couple stories said in 2012 during Obama's uh, re-election that keep coming forward until a kind of fictionalized present. Um, we're also moving here from youth to age, from the youngest characters to the oldest, from a kind of innocence toward disillusionment. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. So we're gonna move from teenage now to middle age. Um, I'm gonna read the end of a story uh, called Jubilee. And Jubilee is a story about a couple sort of taking stock of their marriage all in the weeks leading up to the husband's 50th birthday party. They've got this elaborate party planned, a ridiculously elaborate party plan. Um, there are gonna be a lot of names in this section. You can disregard almost all of them. Uh, this is the story in which characters from all the other stories appear. Um, 
The only names that you might uh, want to keep an eye on, uh, the, couple's name, uh, the couple's names are Dean and Kendra Walker. Uh, their son, Thomas, has come home for the party, and he has brought with him, uh, he's, Thomas is at college, he's brought with him a girl named Brooke to meet his parents for the first time. They have a dog named Popcorn. Richard Bausch just rolled in, and all of a sudden I got nervous. Like, I saw Bausch coming around the corner, and I was like, oh, shit, Bausch is here. <coughs> I don't know what that's all about, but it happened. I don't even, I don't get nervous at readings anymore. Thanks for that, Dick. You want me to go back to the beginning? You sure? And start again? You missed about 10 good minutes. <laughs> Here we go. <clears throat> this is the ending uh, of a story called Jubilee. Yeah, I think I told you everything you need to know. Okay, here we go. Uh, this old hotel was built in 1856. 40 rooms and a restaurant on the tip of Point Clear the very place a pendant would dangle from a chain. Eight years later, the Confederates commandeered it for a hospital, their gravestones still visible from the 18th tee. The golf course was added in the 20s, more rooms, swanky cottages, the grand ballroom. It's said that F. Scott Fitzgerald was a guest in the new wing, though no photos of his stay exist. The Army Air Corps used the hotel as a training base during World War II, those polite boys removing their boots before entering to preserve the hardwood floors, history shining like wax on every surface, in every room and hall, on the brass railed bar, windows reflecting wavery images of passing figures, walking paths buckled by the roots of oak trees even older than the hotel. At the first hint of evening, lights flick on inside and out, drawing the hotel out of the gloom making it glimmer and shine. A great ship, an ocean liner from another time, about to embark upon a long voyage across a wide and tranquil sea. Kendra has already made several trips back and forth from house to ballroom, checking in with the event staff, the caterer, the band. Everything proceeds apace. It will be Thanksgiving in two weeks. In her slip, blow drying her hair, it occurs to Kendra that her wedding was only slightly more elaborate. But the party was Dean's idea. She asked him what he wanted for his birthday, and he said food and friends and music, plenty to drink. She'd been thinking of a trip, Rome or Paris, just the two of them. When she emerges from the bathroom, hair warm against her neck, there is Dean humming as he fingers studs into his tuxedo shirt, and her reservations fall away. This party is not a black tie affair. The other men will be wearing blazers and slacks, shirts open at the collar. Dean pretends he's sporting his tux ironically, but Kendra knows he likes the way it looks. I don't want there to be any question, he says, just who's the man of honor at this shindig. <coughs> then, finally, it's time to go. Night has fallen. Kendra sends Thomas and Brooke on ahead to greet the early arrivals. Headlights, even now, brushing back the darkness. The valets will have their hands full. More people are coming than Kendra could have guessed. Her husband is that esteemed. His partner, Arthur Bowling, will be present along with all three of their associates. There will be clients like Walter Willett, who runs a tugboat operation, and A.B. Ransom, who runs a shipbuilding concern. His wife, Muriel, is one of Kendra's favorites, a perfect mobile lady. Eric Newtboom, whose company transports materials all over the world, is winging in from Denmark. Dean provides counsel for his activities in the Gulf. There will be old friends like Diane and Curtis Henley and Jeb and Posey White and Dean's tennis buddy, Paul St. Clair. Martha and Buddy Bragg accepted the invitation. Their son, Henry, is a fraternity brother of Thomas's at Alabama. Lewis and Mona, who finagled Kendra's first date with her husband, will be attending, though they are long divorced. Mona will be unescorted. Lewis is bringing his new wife. On and on the guest list goes, Isaac and Hannah Yates, Ellen and Charlie Caldwell, Marcus Weems, whose wife is sick with cancer, names 
mapping the itinerary of their marriage. Popcorn, shimmies, and wines nuzzling their limp fingers, their clothes. He is aware that something out of the ordinary is afoot. He is right to suspect that he will be left out. Sorry, boy, Dean says, easing the door closed, the dog mashing his wet nose against the glass. Arm in arm, Dean and Kendra make their way along the boardwalk. Their house is only six driveways from the old hotel. The night is crisp enough to miss their breath, moonlight glinting on the bay like broken glass. You look beautiful, Dean says. And Kendra says, so do you. They pass on beneath the oaks, branches draped with moss. Suddenly, Dean is nervous. It's like the dream in which he enters a courtroom unprepared. He has made a mistake. His tuxedo is absurd. He has no idea what he will say to his guests. There is nothing important left to talk about. A dozen bicycles lean in a rack, waiting for hotel guests to claim them. The flag is lifeless on its pole. There is no wind, no chatter of insects. At last, the famous ballroom emerges from the night, all delicate light and lofty windows, guests already mingling beyond the glass, waiters passing hors d'oeuvres. The voices from inside reach them muted and obscure, another frame sliding forward in Dean's dream, the one where everyone is speaking a language he cannot understand. Wait, Kendra says, tugging his arm. What is it? Just look, she says. They're here for you. All those familiar faces, it's like gazing into the past. Elbow to elbow at the bar, Buddy Bragg and Charlie Caldwell and Isaac Yates wait for their drinks, their wives standing to one side. Paul St. Clair is talking Alabama football with Curtis Henley. There is only one subject in the fall that could make their faces so intent. Behind them, Thomas and Brooke are laughing at something A.B. Ransom has just said. Decorous Muriel swats her husband's bicep. The joke must have been unseemly. Thomas's teeth flash when he laughs. The crooked incisors of his childhood straightened long ago. And here are Dean and Kendra Walker, alone together in the dark. She kisses his jaw, wipes the lipstick print with the heel of her hand. His rush of nerves is passing. He just needs a drink, that's all. On their wedding day, Dean convinced a bridesmaid to slip Kendra a note. It's not too late, the note said. We can still elope. Kendra held on to it for years. She kept it in a box with tarnished hinges along with other personal souvenirs, a matchbook, a mateless earring, a ticket stub. Now it is too late. It's far too late. Faintly, from back the way they've come, they can hear popcorn barking, the sound of him shrill and brokenhearted. They must stay this course until the end. My wife advised me to read something funny. Um, obviously, I didn't. In fact, her exact words were, there's a story in here that, that she um, particularly likes called Smash and Grab. And her exact words were, oh, quit worrying and read Smash and Grab, you little chicken shit. <laughs> um, <clears throat> obviously, I did not take her advice. It's also possible that she didn't say chicken shit, but it was clearly implied by her tone. Um, there's not going to be any jokes in this reading. There won't be one. I feel obliged, though, to say that there, there are funny passages in this book. Um, it's not all... I got a little, a little verklempt myself reading that. Um, so uh, we're going to move forward in time again to the fictionalized present. Um, just real quick. Uh, there is a book reviewer in, uh, down in Alabama uh, named Don Noble. Does any of you know Don Noble? I should, I should emphasize the word A. There's a book reviewer in the state of Alabama. Um, and it, his name is Don Noble. Um, uh, Don, he writes reviews for the Tuscaloosa News, and these reviews are sometimes picked up in other papers around the state. But more importantly, what he does, and I assume a lot of you guys have maybe done this before, Don does this show called Bookmarks for Alabama Public Television. And it's, it's great fun to do. He does a sort of long-form interview with writers talking about their books. And, when this book was out, I think I was in Monroeville for the Harper Lee Festival there, and Don came over from Tuscaloosa, and we shot a segment in this beautiful old 
library, <clears throat> and there was a kind of break in the shooting, and um, you know, people were like touching up our makeup and things. And Don said, you know what I wanted to call, um, what I wanted to title my review of your book, but didn't was, rich white people have feelings too. Um, and I, I, uh, while it was difficult to argue against the, the uh, accuracy of that title, um, I felt it was a little dismissive. And I suggested that we talk about that in the next segment of the, of the thing, and we did. And uh, one of the things we talked about um, was how the younger generation in a lot of these stories is beginning to recognize uh, cracks in the, in the veneer of this privileged world and pushing back against it, and how the older generation of these characters, their view of the world has been distorted by privilege, and, and they don't see the world in the way that the world actually is, and in many cases in these stories, they believe themselves to be sheltered from and protected from the tragedy of the world. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a story, um, it's the second to last piece in the book, uh, called The King of Dolphin Island, in which some of that is addressed. It's going to be touched on in the section that I read, but um, the story is, is about uh, a character who is unwilling to accept this terrible thing that happens in his life because he believes that it, it couldn't possibly happen to him. Uh, I should also add, this story first appeared in the Swanee Review, and I was very grateful for that humbled by that, that great tradition of that magazine and uh, all the work Adam has done to reboot it. And uh, his notes on this story definitely made the story better. Um, so uh, there you are. Thank you, Adam. Um, I'm going to read the beginning of a story called The King of Dauphin Island, and then you'll be done with Evening Land, and we'll get a little taste of this new story. This is from the beginning of The King of Dauphin Island. Marcus Weems, excuse me, let me, let me start, let me try that again. Marcus Weems was the sixth richest man in the state of Alabama, but he lost his wife to cancer, like everybody else. Of course, he brought the full leverage of his affluence to bear on her condition. Sloan Kettering, Johns Hopkins, MD Anderson, names of hospitals like the board of directors for some conglomerate of suffering. But the diagnosis had come too late, all the treatments and the clinical trials for naught, and Suzette Weems died at home with her family at her bedside the day's last light outside her windows reflected on Mobile Bay. In addition to her devoted husband, Suzette Weems was survived by two daughters, Meredith, 29, wife of Harris Stokes and mother of infant James, and Emily, 21, treasurer of Kappa Kappa Gamma sorority at the University of Alabama. They were capable and well-adjusted girls, achingly dear to Marcus. After the funeral, Emily requested incompletes in her fall classes and resumed permanent occupancy of her room, perfuming the house with the lavender and praline bouquet of her shampoo. At least three nights a week, with infant James in tow, Meredith abandoned her husband to sleep over as well, regularly enough that she stocked the empty bureau of her youth with diapers and onesies and nursing bras. Marcus thought he understood. They believed that their presence would provide a bulwark against his loss. They loved him, and he loved them back, and he was willing to humor them for a while. Together, they strolled the Point Clear boardwalk, gulls wheeling, infant James strapped to one of them by a contraption that put Marcus in mind of a papoose. They played backgammon in the evenings, and Marcus let them win as he had when they were children. The holidays passed in a haze of dirty dishes and wads of wrapping paper and strained good cheer. Marcus was 68 years old. He'd started late on marriage, fatherhood. He'd wanted to be certain that he was prepared to do it right. And he had. Just look at his magnificent daughters. But now, at night, when everyone was asleep, he found himself creeping from room to room in the dark, picking up letter openers and coffee table books and putting them down again like he'd forgotten what they were for. In January, he nudged Emily back to school and convinced Meredith that her husband required her attention. They went reluctantly, but they went, casting worried glances through the rear windshields of their cars. Marcus had, in the course of his career, 
parlayed a modest inheritance into a fortune in commercial real estate. His holdings included a condominium complex on Dauphin Island, a barrier island off the coast. Without informing his daughters, he put the house on the market, a pocket listing, price to move, let the condo manager know he was coming, and drove alone across the bridge over the sound. The Admiral's quarters rose up from the sand where the beach was at its widest. Marcus claimed a corner unit on the fourth and highest floor. Two bedrooms, one bath, combined kitchen and living area, every accoutrement tastefully bland. Among real estate professionals, it is a widely held belief that beach rentals, especially condominiums, are rarely haunted by anything more than the detritus of previous guests, those battered paperbacks, that bottle of hot sauce, those loose pennies in a drawer. From his balcony, Marcus could see an old public pier jutting like a ruin over the dunes, the shore tugged out by tides in such a way that the pier no longer reached the waves. His daughters were predictably stunned by this turn of events, not to mention wounded, furious, concerned, and a number of additional sentiments which they expressed in weepy monologues over the phone Marcus could hear the wind whining around the building as they spoke, and the distant hissing of the surf sounds indistinguishable from his tinnitus, a cocoon of white noise that made it difficult to focus on his daughters. Didn't he realize Emily wanted to know that they had lost their mother too? Shouldn't he have at least consulted them, Meredith demanded, before listing the house? They had a talent for phrasing questions in such a way that the answers were implied. And they were right. His behavior was selfish and impulsive and thoroughly out of character. Daddy, they called him, still like little girls. He bought a bike secondhand from a rental shop down the road, a lady's bike, though Marcus didn't mind, a lipstick, red, Schwinn, Hollywood Roadster, handlebars outfitted with a bell and basket, everything but the basket freckled with rust. Dauphin Island is bisected lengthwise by Bienville Boulevard, 12 miles of sandy pavement paralleled by sidewalk. Down this sidewalk rode Marcus Weems, exploring, acclimating, as if the island were a scale model of his life without Suzette or of the space left inside him by her absence and he wanted to plot its boundaries. Mornings, he rode to Lighthouse Bakery for a cup of coffee and a bear claw. He rode to Pirate's Booty Bait and Dry Goods in the afternoon to stock up on peanut butter and white bread. The west end of the island had been stripped of all but the most obdurate shrubbery by careless development and countless storms. Nothing down there anymore but vacation homes on stilts and a ribbon of beach visible only at low tide. One day, Marcus counted 26 for sale signs. The day after that, he counted 29. Most of the year-round residents were hunkered down on the east end, tucked in along the sound or on the leeward side of the dunes. Marcus coasted past their houses, pulled lazy U-turns in their cul-de-sacs. He rode past Dauphin Elementary, the only school on the island, and past Cadillac Park, live oaks dripping beards of Spanish moss, and past the bird sanctuary where so many weary species headed north for warmer months first caught sight of land. He kept on riding until he ran out of Boulevard all the way to Fort Gaines, best remembered by history for its failure to prevent the Yankee fleet from breaching Mobile Bay. Here, Marcus dropped the kickstand and dismounted. He stood watch at the edge of Dauphin Island, his old life just out of sight across the water. What he felt in those moments, pelicans skimming the chop, tankers lugging cargo to ports unknown, was not loneliness or loss, as you might expect. Not the weight of tragedy, but its opposite, pure lightness. The hole left inside him by Suzette's death as big and hollow as a zeppelin and just as buoyant, as if the shape of her absence might lift him up and carry him away. All right, that's enough of that. Oh. Wait, we got, we got one more thing. 
Okay, this is real short. Uh, it doesn't feel right to call this story new. I wrote it a couple years back, but it has not appeared in a book. It is currently, I ask for your help on this, it is currently titleless. It was at one point uh, called The Last War Story as a kind of tip of the hat to Tim O'Brien. You'll see why that hat needed to be tipped when I read the story. Um, but it didn't, that title didn't really fit the story, so I changed it to A Light at the End of the Wharf, which seemed a little sentimental. So Donovan, if you can think of a better title, please let me know after the reading. <clears throat> this is a titleless story that goes like this. My father's war story is a simple one. He shipped out to Vietnam in 1968, an ROTC lieutenant trained for airborne duty. All blood and balls to hear him tell it, but I have a difficult time seeing my father in that more dangerous light. He is a small man, maybe five foot eight, the top of his head hardly even with my chin. He wears bifocals and carries a key ring with too many keys. But there he was, 22 years old, standing on a tarmac with the other new arrivals, waiting for somebody to tell him which way to go, when four guys rolled up in a truck and started reloading a plane with coffins, dead men to be channeled home. He stopped counting at 19. Much to his relief, he was routed out of Airborne two days later and reassigned to an officer's club on the South China Sea. My father spent Vietnam at the beach. He played volleyball and borrowed insect repellent. He managed inventory at the club. It would have been a tragedy if the war ran out of booze. He attended hygiene classes and wrote letters to a girl back in Alabama. He bought a camera like he was away at summer camp and mailed the pictures home, palm trees and elephant grass and men whose names he can't remember now. He saw traces of the war distant blooms of light above the tree line and flickering sound like thunder and heat lightning. They had resupply choppers moving in and out, and sometimes they took mortar fire, a few stray rounds that scattered sand and seawater impressively, then tapered off without anybody getting hurt. His commanding officer, a Texan named Bible, maintained a veneer of military discipline, salutes and guard duty and observation posts out on the perimeter, but nothing serious, nothing that could get you killed. Once or twice a week, my father would wander down to the nearby village with his camera and his sidearm. He never carried bullets, but he always had plenty of film. He took pictures of mud huts and water buffalo and old women washing clothes in the Chulai River. This one particular Mama San had picked up a few bars of I want to be loved by you from somewhere. Boop, boopy doop, she would say when my father took her picture. And my father would say it right back. Boop, boopy doop, like it was part of some secret that they shared. If this were a more complicated story, here would come the rising action. My father would be transferred to a combat unit, or his old Mama San would turn out BC and try to kill him in his sleep. But as I said, this war story is a simple one. <clears throat> Pardon me. The hero does his rotation and ships home and marries the girl. She bears him two children, four years apart. They build a house on a river and he practices law. God almighty. All right, hang on. <clears throat> Zit, th 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 All right, now we're ready. She bears him two children, four years apart. They build a house on a river, and he practices law in the town of his birth. Every morning, he wakes and kisses his wife, sees his children off to school, and never once is he called upon to prove his courage in the traditional sense. <clears throat> he never faces down an intruder or rescues his family from a fire. God almighty. No one gets cancer or has an affair. So where is the dramatic tension? Where is the rush of a narrative line? When I was 16 years old, I gave my father a story I had written. It was about a kid my age who heard voices and went around starting fires all the time. My father came back to my room 
in the middle of the night and sat on the edge of the bed. He shook my shoulder to wake me. He wanted to be sure everything was all right. I told him I was fine. It was just a story. I could see a light outside on the end of the wharf, and I knew my father was debating whether or not he needed to haul himself down there and take care of it before he went to bed. My father is the sort of man who will let a thing like that. A burning light or an open window or an unanswered question keep him awake at night. I could sense him weighing matters in his head, the winter cold, and getting dressed all over again versus the effect a light left burning would have on his sleep. He sighed and shifted on the bed. What happened to simple stories, he said. Why can't people ever write stories where everything turns out all right in the end? That's not a story, I said. You could write about a father and son who go fishing or something and discover they have a lot in common. That's a story I'd like. <laughs> right, I said, sure. After a while, he patted me on the back and shuffled off in his bedroom slippers, closing my door behind him. I was big on privacy in those days. I listened to him grumbling to my mother about the light, heard the back door open and close. He appeared in the yard a few seconds later with a parka over his PJs and made his way to the end of the wharf. For a long time, he just stood there, his breath ghostly in the cold. The water was as dark and still as the sky. Oh, Lord have mercy, we're almost to the end of this thing. The water was as dark and still as the sky. I watched him shake his head, clearing out the cobwebs of whatever he'd been thinking. Finally, he turned and looked up at my window and hit the light switch, and I couldn't see him anymore. Here then, is a story for my father.